there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. We're sponsoring a new band. It's called The Velvet Underground. And what they demonstrated so clearly was that something like rock music which was looked down upon and which was reviled or just put off as being insubstantial, could be elevated to something poetic. The Velvet Underground were one of the most unique bands of the 1960s. Even though the power and influence of their music has been widely acknowledged, they were all but ignored within their own time. This is the story of their music and the band who made it. The Velvet Underground formed in New York during 1964, when John Cale, a classically trained musician from Wales, met Lou Reed, who was currently working as a staff songwriter for Pickwick Records. The pair quickly recruited Sterling Morrison on guitar and bass and Mo Tucker on drums. Taking their name from Michael Lee's sadomasochistic novel, the band quickly attracted the attention of eccentric New York-based artist Andy Warhol. Warhol instantly became both a benefactor and an advocate for the group. We're sponsoring a new band. It's called The Velvet Underground. And um, when, since I don't really believe in painting anymore, I thought it would be a nice way of combining, uh, and we have this chance to combine music and, and art and uh, uh, films all together. And, to the, and we're sort of working on that. And, and uh, well, the whole thing is being auditioned tomorrow at 9 o'clock. And if it works out, it might be very glamorous. As well as providing the group with a stage on which to perform, Warhol also controversially introduced a second singer to the band. Nico, a beautiful Hungarian chanteuse, had recently arrived in New York from London, where she had recorded the Dylan song, I'll Keep It With Mine. On Warhol's insistence, she took lead vocals on several of the Velvet Underground songs. You gotta have a beautiful girl in it. And his Nico was the beautiful girl, you know. So this whole thing of forcing that on the group and wedging it in with shoehorns and chisels and spikes, it came about and it worked. But like Lou had to be just about begged by Andy to do it. And, and so when we performed, you know, it was developed underground in Nico. Andy introduced her to us, and I thought I thought that the songs she did sing were perfect, but uh, we never intended that now it's the Velvet Underground and Nico. That it was just a, that was in our minds a temporary thing. Warhol and his entourage quickly developed what became known as the Exploding Plastic Inevitable, a multimedia show featuring a live performance from the band. The show is really, uh, in fact, very often on stage, I would think, man, I'd like to be out there and seeing this. It must be really <laughs> interesting. Despite Warhol's promotional efforts, the band was still no closer to being signed. 
So while still performing nightly with the exploding plastic inevitable, the group made the unusual decision to record an album before securing a record contract. To facilitate the album's production, Warhol approached Norman Dolph, who was currently working for Columbia Records. I got involved with the Velvet Underground via Warhol. Because I was working for Columbia, uh, and they asked me if I knew how to get such a thing done. And I was working for the custom manufacturing division of Columbia, where they made records for Atlantic and Warners, and one of the accounts that I handled was Scepter. They had a studio office on uh, 54th Street. The guy that was their chief engineer was a guy named John Licata. He was a journeyman engineer for Scepter and would record whatever they had on the books. He'd record gospel in the morning and Dion Warwick in the afternoon and Marv Johnson at night. And, and they, they had a deal with, with Scepter that any time the studio wasn't booked, he could sell himself in the studio to outside clients and, and pocket the dough. The only restriction was he had to work around the stuff that Scepter was doing ordinarily. And that was their perk to him. And so we, we made an arrangement. Uh, I believe that the budget was 600 bucks which was uh, essentially, I believe, to be two long days of recording, two or three. The whole thing took place, in my best recollection, over parts of four days in one week. I remember being in the studio the first time. Yeah, I was very excited. It was so different. I've never obviously done anything like that. John and Lou had, but that was totally new to me, and it was very exciting to be making a record. Um, and it, it was fun, but it was also nerve-wracking. We only had eight hours, so none of us wanted to mess it up or have to do it again or whatever, because we just didn't have the time for it. In the years since the album was recorded, some confusion has grown up around Andy Warhol's precise role in the record's production. Andy didn't play any role in the first record. Not a technical role. He was always a cheerleader, sort of, but which was great to have, but no, he, he didn't play any role. The musical decisions, I would say, were made in the, in the main by John Cale and Sterling in terms of the balance uh, or, uh, or feel-wise in nature, I would give them credit for. I didn't have a last word on anything except to listen for things that sounded like m true mistakes and somebody knocked over a, a music stand or, or you'd hear something that wasn't mixed right that you just clearly couldn't handle and they'd look at John and he'd say, yeah, let's start it over. And we'd break the take down and start the thing over from the head. So in most of those songs, there is only one surviving take. There may be some, some scraps, but uh, they were done, and, and then people would come in and listen to it, and they'd say, either let's do it over from the top, or let's buy it. And, uh, but the, they were mostly done in, in one complete shot takes. I think it affected the process, uh, or the result, um, favorably, because we didn't have time for nonsense. We didn't have time to overdub a solo, for instance, or things like And I don't think even in those days you had four tracks or two or something, so. With the record complete, Dolph took a copy of the album and pitched it to his current employers at Columbia Records. At the end of the, uh, at the session, they did a, a mono mix, and uh, I took that uh, tape to Columbia, where we had an acetate cut. And that acetate was presented to Columbia's A&R department. I said, look, this is a new group sponsored by Andy Warhol, uh, radical new sound, making all kinds of waves in, uh, in the, uh, the East Village. And is this something Columbia's A&R department want to sign on for? And I got the acetate back in about 48 hours with a, with a memo saying, there's no way in the world any sane person would buy or want to listen or put anything behind this record. I, I passed it back to Warhol and Morrissey, and it's only about a year or a little more later does it surface on MGM Verve. Now, one thing it can never fully be known, I guess, or I, I, Lou Reed may be able to shed some light on it, but to Tom Wilson, the guy who was the spearhead of it at MGM Verve, had worked for Columbia at the time it was shown to Columbia. Now, I don't know whether his ears ever heard it at Columbia uh, and had an opinion on it or not. Tom Wilson is, is a very significant figure on the entire rock scene in the mid-60s. I mean, 
here is somebody who's, whose real reputation within pop circles, of course, is as the producer of Bob Dylan, who, after all, is the cutting-edge figure at that point. When they first came into contact, he, he was still doing freelance work for Columbia. Um, so the story goes, essentially, uh, he told them, no, wait, I'm going to MGM, to Verve, come with me. But what he would have had to work with in terms of the New York sessions, what they'd produced, Wilson seems to have pretty good instincts about what needed to be recut. They redid three songs. They did Waiting for the Man Again, they did Heroin, and they did Venus and Furs. Um, when they finished, Wilson decided that the record wasn't strong enough and he wanted a single and so that's when he he asked them to write a single specifically for Nico and um, that would be Sunday Morning. Sunday Morning was released as a single in December 1966. However, it was not to feature Nico on lead vocals as Tom Wilson had wished. Sunday morning brings the dawn in. It's just a restless feeling by my side. Early dawning, Sunday morning. It's just the wasted years so close behind. Watch out, the world's behind. Sort of a hallmark of Lou's relations with Nico at that point that he wrote the song and then when they got into the studio refused to let Nico sing it. You know, when they got there, Lou sang it in a voice that was so feminine, it out, you know, it was more feminine than Nico could possibly have done. I think that may have been intentional on his part to pretty it up and say, you know, we don't need this girl singing, I can do it myself. So it was it was a, an attempt really to get a single because they want it to be successful. It's not one of these things where we want to die in obscurity, we want to be played on the radio, we want people to buy our records, so let's give them something that is good and we love, um, but is, a, is accessible. And Sunday Morning is a beautiful, beautiful recording. People forget that while the Velvets were dark, they had a certain heroin chic about them, they were certainly decadent up to a point in a very streetwise manner. They did have songs like Sunday Morning, which had a very happy, happy, joy, joy, pop theme to it. The thematics of the Velvet Underground weren't just trying to sort of push the envelope. They also realised that sometimes caressing the envelope could be even more effective. Although the Velvet Underground finished recording in May 1966, Due to a variety of legal problems, the record was not released until 1967. This delay was further compounded by the record's exceptionally complicated sleeve design, which today has become as iconic as the music itself. I worked on the first album cover, but we did it as a group at the factory. Andy, Paul, Gerard, I mean, you know, we all contributed different images and what have you. And if you look on the credits on the Velvet Underground and Nico album, I'm listed as Billy Linick, which is who I was in the avant-garde art world before I became Billy Name of factory fame. One of the truly radical things that the album does, everyone forgets. If you open up the original album, it's got all these quotes about the band. The only thing is, 80% of them are really, really nasty. They hate the band. And the band, rather than actually burying these attacks on them, make them part of the album cover, which is a, an extraordinarily radical gesture. The album cover for the, the Velvet Underground and Nico is fun. It's a fun record. And that's not to say that it wasn't uh, calculated, because it's a banana. What does it look like? It looks like a penis, right? It's a big penis on a record. And then the, the addition of the, the temptation to want to peel this off is like, oh, what is underneath? And you're expecting something really nasty and dirty. And then, oh, you know what it is? It's a pink banana underneath, right? Gotcha. The Velvet Underground and Nico was released in March 1967, and although the record was famously ignored in its own time, 
it has since gone on to become recognised as one of the most innovative and unique recordings in modern music. The Velvet Underground and Nico is, is one of those literally handful of albums that you don't really see the precedence for. There are literally a handful in rock music where you, you put the album on and you don't see where, what leads up to it. The, the, there is nothing that says, oh, and the next step is the Velvet Underground and Nico. And no matter how radical something may sound on first listening, most of the time, almost all of the time, you're going, ah, yeah, they've combined beef heart with the MC5, or, you know, that, that, that it's some kind of melange of, of things that have come before. Now, of course, no music is completely new, but I dare anybody to say that they heard Venus in Furs on Velvet Underground and Nico and went, ah, I can hear, that's a, a bit of John Cage taken with Lamont Young, uh, mixed in with a little, no, it's just from nowhere. I remember the first time I heard Venus and Furs, and it was the first time I heard the Banana album. And the first couple of tracks, I was with a couple of friends, we were listening to it in their parents' based on an old hi-fi with legs on it, really old thing. And I popped this record on, I had just purchased it, and as we're all talking, I'm sort of listening to it in the background. Then I hear Sunday morning, and it sounds like a pop song. And I kind of, I'm sort of listening to the record, and I'm listening to them, and I'm, and I'm sort of ignoring it until Venus and Furs comes on. And then suddenly everything else is shut out. Venus in Furs is the breakthrough. And I don't just mean in terms of the Velvet Underground. I mean in terms of rock music. Um, you know, it, it probably is the most important rock song since Heartbreak Hotel. You know, it, 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 because it essentially kicks open the door. It says you don't have to use the same three instruments. You don't have to talk about the same subject matters. And the fact that it would pick something as, as relatively dangerous as a Saka Masak's um, S&M novel from the 19th century as a subject, to do that in a pop song, you know, is such an unimaginably radical gesture. Before joining the Velvet Underground, John Cale had worked exclusively within the classical avant-garde. Influenced by the music of John Cage and Lamont Young, Cale had brought these more experimental elements with him to his new band. this underlying avant-garde aesthetic that came from Cage and Lamont Young and Kale being part of that mindset of the, the long tone. That long tone uh, was the Kale gift to the Velvet Underground, that haunting undertone, the underground tone. That sound was not a sound that I'd ever heard or that anybody had, that nyong, you know, which, it's more than a, it's an electrified viola, but once you know that's what it is, but otherwise it could be, you know, doom incarnate as far as the sound goes. John was, you know, very inventive and, and oh, let's do that and let me try this. And I think he, he had more, I think, 
more to do with um, the songs becoming what they were. Um, now, of course, Lou wrote them, so obviously he had a lot to do with it too. But I think you know the final product. I think had a lot, a lot more to do with John than people maybe realize. I remember being on the other side of the glass. You, you say to myself, "My God, the, 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 I, I am seeing exactly what it would be like if I were injecting." And so the control room wasn't very large. It was just John and I and. Warhol came in from time to time. It was a transfixing experience because I believe the other musicians also were in the control room and they had heard it a hundred times, but uh, it was, it was something. Just where I'm going But I'm Gonna try For the kingdom If I can Cause it makes me feel like I'm a man When I put a spike in He's attempting to communicate an experience that is almost impossible to communicate to somebody who's never taken heroin, using the power of language. Now, of course, if you can add the power of music on top of that, you really do have something. He puts these two chords together in a way that is deceptively simple, but he said himself that if you listen to the song, which pretty much labeled the Velvets as a drug band right out of the gate. Um, it's not a pro-heroin song by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's in a sense more about uh, transcendence and surrender. And it doesn't really glorify the dope uh, experience, but what it does is it presents it in a thematic way, very accurately, deceptively seductive in the start. Beautiful. And then the song starts to build in a way. Sterling had said that it's inevitable that as the song builds, that you're singing it faster and playing it faster. And it starts this train that you can't get off. And much like the drug experience, by the time you realize you're on it, it's too late to get off. No one maybe ever even notices this, but right in the middle of it, the drums stop. And the reason is because no one ever thinks about the drummer. They're all worried about what the guitar sound like and stuff, and nobody's thinking about the drummer. Well, as soon as it got loud and fast, I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear anybody. So I stopped, assuming, well, they'll stop too and say, what's the matter, Mo? <laughs> but nobody stopped. And then, you know, so I came back in, and to this, that just... I loved that song, and when we, I loved playing it, and having that on the record just kills me. The interesting thing about heroin uh, is that it is quite clear when you read the lyrics that it is a poem. Um, so this this is something that even if we didn't have Reed's first-hand account, you would have to imagine was something he wrote as a piece of poetry, and that then conceived of a way of performing. 
Of all the, the lyricists of the 60s, if you go back and listen to all of them, I think the, the two that stand out are, are Bob Dylan and, and Lou Reed, the ones that are just doing something head and shoulders above what everyone else was writing. Nobody uh, at the time that Reed started as a rock lyricist could fail to be influenced by Dylan. The difference is essentially um, one of angle of attack because Reed wants to present a world of brutality. Uh, and wants to suggest that there is something more ethereal, greater, you know, more uh, spiritual somewhere around the edges of what is a very brutal real world. I wish that I'd sail the darkened seas on a great big clipper ship going from this land here to that put on a sailor's suit and cap he's so straightforward and he's so simple he doesn't waste any words every word that he uses has an effect it's got it's got a purpose for being there he's a great writer he's not just a great songwriter Big cities where a man cannot be free of all of the evil in this town and of himself and those around. Oh, and I guess I just don't know. Oh, and I guess that I just don't know. While living in an apartment on Ludlow Street, a very early incarnation of the band demoed several key tracks in the summer of 1965. Among them was a rather different version of I'm Waiting for the Man. But unlike Heroin, which on those Ludlow Street demos sounds exactly like the song we all know and love, um, Lou's um, enamorment with uh, Bob Dylan probably reached its peak at the point that they were recording this. And it sounds for, for the whole world like Bob Dylan doing Lead Belly. So the um, vibe, if I can sort of give it a shot, is something more like... Well, I'm waiting for my man. He actually is doing his most convincing Lou. I'm waiting for my man. <laughs> it even sounds like Dylan. Um, whereas the actual realized version of the song, you know, Lou, Lou did have a mastery of integrating his lyrical and subject matter along with Kale's, um, you know, cooperation into achieving a sound, a rhythmic sound, and a pulse with the instruments that reflected that lyrical matter. And with uh, Waiting for the Man, it's a train, and it is definitely, you know, heading uptown. The image is brilliant. It's a train ride, it's a subway ride, and you, the song does sound like you're on a subway train. Lou and John used to busk on street corners in Harlem with that song, and you can hear it. You can hear it as just a couple of kids with guitars playing it. Um, so when you hear it on the record as a finished product, it's like, what is this? There's so much energy, there's so much electricity to it. And I think that really has to do with Maureen's drumming, propelling that song. Mo Tucker, like uh, Tommy Ardelli, Tommy Ramon in, in the Ramones 10 years later, was an essentially untrained drummer. I mean, she wasn't, I mean, I used to think that she had never played at all. That turns out not to be true, but she was not a full-time drummer with a lot of chops. 
and like Tommy Ardelli, um, was forced to use her brain to do simple things that were effective. And that was a crucial part of the Velvet Underground groove. I think the whole band adjusted to her notion of what time was, and it made that band sound radically different. When we first played together, we did a lot of um, improvising, and just playing a kit just didn't fit, I didn't think. I, also, I was probably trying to be a little African. That sound, you know, a deeper sound. I didn't want high-pitched sounds. You know, I was the rhythm section, and, and I, always, I always hate in songs where the drum stops because now the drummer's banging on the cymbals or I hate that. To me, it's, you know, the, the drum should be throughout the song. Um, and I, I felt like it was my job, me and Sterl, basically, to keep, for instance, it would just be noise. If there's no rhythm under there, it's just noise. Mo was a great drummer in, in a minimalist, limited, autodidactic way that I think changed musical history. I think she is the sort, I mean, she, she's where the punk notion of how the beat works begins. You no, know, I specifically remember the, the Nico tunes, the, uh, especially All Tomorrow's Parties. It was, it was hypnotic because I was as close to her as I am to you now, except there was a glass wall between us, right? But, and, and she is mesmerizing with that accent and the, this absolute detachment uh, of, of, of her persona and what she's projecting against the actual words that you're hearing her sing, uh, which are re really quite intense. And that, that, oh, I don't know, juxtaposition between the way she looked and came across and the way she sounded, uh, uh, there was no place to fit that. It, it was without a precedent. To me, it seems to be like the most perfectly crafted of the Velvet Underground songs because it seems like everyone does what they're supposed to do. You've got um, the beautiful, uh, beautiful guitar lines by Lou Reed throughout. They're, they're, they're edgy and they're rough, but they, they take that song to places that you would never think of. And then you've got John Cale's piano in that, which is almost, um, it, it's elegant. It's, it's, you know, people think of the band as being very noisy and very harsh, but I think there's a very, there's very uh, great deal of elegance to it, and especially in that song. And then Nico brings the whole thing together with this um, unexpected European feel to it, to her voice. She's got the accent, she's got the, that great tone, that great Germanic tone. Her voice, in a way, had a Mariam Faithful feel, and also Marlena Dietrich Tamba. So it was 1930s decadent German cabaret combined with the 1960s decadent British rock and pop scene. Perfect. And it worked magnificently on something like All Tomorrow's Parties because it was a bringing together of two, you could almost hear the bringing together of two giant talents, the Lou Reed, John Cale, Maureen Tucker end, and Nicker on the other side. Neither of them really knew what they could bring out from the other, but were prepared to give it a go. Despite the album's cult status today, on its release it was all but ignored and barely managed to chart at all. After the release, the Velvet Underground left the direct management of Andy Warhol. 
They also stopped performing with Nico, although both Reed and Cale would contribute heavily to her first solo album. In the summer of 1967, the band came under the management of Steve Sesnick and began to appear live again. However, the group made the strange decision to boycott performing in New York. Instead, they began to play the clubs in several East Coast cities, in particular, the Boston Tea Party. Okay, this is the building where the Tea Party uh, was. It's on the south end of Boston. Um, on a street called Berkeley. The building was built back in uh, you know, the 1870s. It was originally a church, then it became a synagogue, a few other things. The sound in the room was really fantastic. I mean, I think that was one of the things that really dis distinguished it. A lot of the bands that played here would always say like they really loved playing here. And the Velvets just sounded fantastic here. And this is a place that they played a lot because it was during that period from 67, which just opened in January 67, through 1970 when they didn't play in New York at all. You have to remember the Tea Party audience at the time was not like, say, the Fillmore, which is, you know, sort of very hippie, or for that matter, like the Dom in New York, which is very New York hip. Boston, in a lot of ways, was a very kind of backwater town. So you had a lot of people going to these dance concerts, we call them, three bucks, get in there and, you know, dance your butt off all night. So the Velvets were just a great dance band. So you had a lot of like local blue collar kids who just kind of lived in the neighborhood. You got students from Harvard and BU and who would come over there. You get an occasional professor wandering, you could just tell. <laughs> and they always brought up a few, you know, people from New York. But it rapidly became a kind of scene where they really settled in. And for whatever reason, and I think it was because it was just such a great band to listen to and dance to, that people in Boston just adopted them. And that, you know, ranges from Harvard, you know, graduate students to, uh, you know, tough kids uh, from the neighborhood. And that really was the start of their, I guess we could call it almost residency, because when I became the manager, I just started booking them really regularly. At the end of the summer of 1967, the group went back into the studio to record their second album, White Light, White Heat. The record was released in January 1968 and again failed to become a commercial success. On first inspection, the album does not boast such a flamboyant sleeve design as its predecessor. However, the record's cover is, in a more subtle way, equally as innovative. The cover, which is uh, a black on black of a, a skull and crossbones tattoo, there's black skull and crossbones on a shiny black background. That came about because uh, when they were going to do the second album, Lou came to me and said, Billy, I want you to do the cover for the second album, for the next album. So I said, Lou, you know, rather than me trying to come up with a design image, why don't I let you look through uh, my, all my negative file and you select something and uh, we'll use that uh, for the cover image. So what he selected was an image from one of um, Warhol's movies called Bike Boy with this stud hustler that we, we, I don't know if we picked him up in Times Square or where we got him, his name was Joe Spencer. He was a neat guy. But anyway, he had that tattoo on his upper bicep forearm. And Lou spotted it in one of the frames from one of the films, from one of the stills I had made on his arm. He was like standing in a doorway uh, with his co-star and, and <laughs> Luke brought this negative strip to me and he says, I want that for the album cover. And I said, you mean this picture? He said, no, the tattoo on the guy's arm, which in a 35 millimeter black and white frame, is like this teeny little thing, you know? And so I really had to like enlarge it enormously, so it got totally grainy, but it was cool, you know, it was, it was funky looking like that. So we used that and I said, well, let's do it in black on black, you know, and it became that great famous album cover. Some people consider White Light, White Heat to be the band in its purest form. There's no Nico, there's no Andy Warhol, there's no gimmicks. It's a black album cover. There's nothing to peel, nothing to goof around with. And the music on there is very dense. It's what the band wanted to do. It was hard and it was fast. Um, so as far as 
that record being um, the essence of the Velvet Underground, I can see that. And I can also see it as being a major, major influence on people who heard it then, who would then influence the people who would become punks. White Light, White Heat is an absolutely great track. It's one of the, I mean, it's a pure rock and roll classic, one of the, and another, another record that really um, presages the whole uh, uh, punk upheaval of the middle 70s. When the Velvets are cited as a major punk influence, I really don't think that you can go back to the Velvet Underground and Nico for that. You might be able to for, for a few tracks, but I think the real punk attitude comes from White Light, White Heat. I think speed was the, was the drug of choice. I seem to remember Sterling telling me a story of of, of the night of the whiteout, or the day of the whiteout. She's been up all night doing speed, and then uh, the sun came up, and, went, went, and there was a this blazing snowstorm, and they walked out, and all of a sudden, it was just like white everywhere. I remember when they brought the master in. One day, uh, they came, Lou came to the factory, he had the master, so uh, we went over to his loft to listen to it, you know, and he wanted me to, what do you think this part and listen to this part, you know, and with the sister, sister uh, Ray was like we were all just flipping out as we heard it, you know, it came over so cool. I love Sister Ray. I, I loved playing it, and I, when I listen to the album, I still get chills. I just absolutely love it. It's really the fact that Sister Ray is the centerpiece of that particular album that it overwhelms everything else that, that is contained around it. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's such a radical statement in, it, in itself. We're going to turn everything up as loud as possible. I don't care if I've got more effects than you. I'm going to use all of them. It's not, I'm not concerned about the mix. It's going to be as loud as I can possibly get it, and you better keep up with me. And you can feel that, the way they play off of each other. You can, you can hear um, the interplay between the organ and the guitars. And you can, you can hear, I mean, luckily you've got Maureen keeping everything down and keeping everything sort of um, where it should be so that this thing just doesn't disintegrate into a million parts. Um, so th it's a very um, it's it's a very telling sort of a track because it does sort of illustrate what was happening within the band and what was to come. By the time of the recording of White Light White Heat, Reed and Kale's relationship had begun to disintegrate, and eight months after the release of the album, John Kale played his final gig with the band. John and Laura was so strongly willful and no one can e draw, tell the other one what to do or and nobody can tell either one of them what to do and the whole thing was that they couldn't have been driven like two musical heads there because in the first place their musical heads were in different places but the way those two different places came together in performance was great but when you get to decision making the two different heads didn't come together. So John and Lou were always like this conflicting thing going on. Well, when John left, it was really sad. I mean, you know, I felt really bad. Um, and of course, this was gonna really influence the music because 
John's a lunatic. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think we became a little more, a little more normal, which was fine. It was good music, good songs. Uh, it was never the same, though. It was never the same. It was good stuff, a lot of good songs, but just the lunacy factor was gone. As witness, when John was gone and we played the same song, it wasn't quite the same. There was definitely a piece that was removed from the band that would, would not ever be replaced. I, would, I don't know how you could ever do that. Where, where else would you find a viola playing Welshman who was an avant-garde student? You know, I think it's kind of a tall order to fill. But, um, but once he was gone, you lost the drone. You lost the, the screeching and, and a lot of the menace that, uh, that you, can, you can hear in, in the first two records. Um, but you also gained, uh, I, I think the band gained something too. They were able to open up a bit more. I think it was inevitable for John to leave. I don't think it could have, it could have continued with him. And that's the feel that you get on White Light, White Heat is just sort of now, it's now or never, and as it turns out, it, it was never. However, the band still had performances booked and so needed to replace Kale quickly. A multi-instrumentalist from Boston, Doug Yule, had befriended the group and quickly became the obvious choice, although another more abstract reason would secure his place within the band. Lou was into the Zodiac, he was into mysticism and things like that. And one of the factors that brought Doug Yule into the band instead of another bass player or singer was the fact that he was a Pisces, and Lou was a Pisces, and Sterling was a Virgo, and Moe was a Virgo. So to have that balance, that, that astrological balance, meant a lot to them. The band was Pisces, Pisces, Virgo, Virgo, and astrology was all the rage. And um, so they called me up and, and, uh, on a Thursday, I think it was, and asked me if I wanted to join a band. He said, can you come down right away to New York? I said, OK. Um, Dick Chandler was just leaving, literally, to drive to New York. So I went and got my stuff together and went down and got in his um, van, Volkswagen, and we drew, which didn't have heat, and we drove down, this was like October, drove down to New York and I met Steve and Lou at Max's Kansas City and as I recall Sterling was there too. Sat, we talked, da da da, -da this is the deal. I said, great. They said, uh, the only catch is would you mind playing bass? And I said, no, that's fine. So um, I went home with Lou, I think, and stayed in his loft, and we started learning songs and played Le Cave that, fr that Saturday, Friday and Saturday. It's interesting, the first gig that they played at a tea party, minus John, was on December 12, 1968. And the very first tune they play is Heroin, which is really pretty daring because that is probably the song most associated with John, the viola, et cetera, et cetera. It came right out there and played it, and bang, it was like fantastic. With Kale, their live performances were genuinely avant-garde. Avant-garde to the point where they must have lost 90% of their audience. When Doug was brought into the band, essentially the focus of the band tightened, and they could concentrate on what actually were their strengths, their real true strengths as a live band. Little over a month after joining the group, Doug Ewell found himself entering TT and G Studios on Sunset Boulevard to record the Velvet Underground's third studio album. I didn't know we were going to do an album. Uh, we were playing in LA, and Steve said, uh, You know, we're, with the change of plans, we're going to stay over an extra week and do an album. And uh, so essentially, all those songs were already being played because the album itself, when it was recorded, was done basically as a live album. Um, we All four of us played together to, for the tracks, um, and then we went back and overdubbed the vocals and uh, any solos, instrumental stuff like that. It seemed um, to just kind of flow, just kind of happen. Uh, it w they were all songs we were playing live, and it was, we didn't, you know, set out to, um, you know, say, well, this is what we want to do, uh, this is what we want to achieve. We want to do the, you know, approach it this way. It just said, uh, what songs do you want to do? Let's do the, you know, and Lou said, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And so we just 
you know, it just, it, it was very organic. And I think one of the reasons it sounds, it has that particular sound is that it was just pulled out of the band while it was on touring, you know. Um, and uh, so it was, there wasn't a lot of time to overthink it. It was just play, you know, just do it. of what goes on with its, with its brilliant uh, dual guitar solo, uh, where the guitar ends up actually sounding like almost like bagpipes, so, you know, shrieking together, um, happened almost by accident. Again, it was a, a limitation of, the, of uh, technology at the time. They only had a certain, a certain number of tracks to deal with, not like now where you've got infinite tracks. Um, and Lou was playing solos and playing solos and playing solo, solos. And it got to a point where, well, if you do one more, we're going to have to take off one of them because we're running out of space. So instead of doing that, I said, why don't you just play them together and see how that sounds? And of course, it turned out to be this classic, beautiful guitar solo, um, which sort of um, is the highlight of that song. The rhythm guitars in that song are just amazing. Both Sterling and Lou are playing very, very fast, very, very, um, very sharp rhythm, and combine that with the other instruments, and you've got this beautiful, long, propellant, great track. The group's self-titled third album, which has become known as the Grey Album was released in March of 1969. Reflecting the change in direction of the music, the sleeve design had similarly become less extravagant. The third one, again, I was to do the cover. And so uh, they came over to the second factory. I did uh, several photo sessions of different headshots, uh, jumping shots, you know, on the floor shots and all this stuff. So uh, also uh, the shots, the shot that's actually on the cover with them sitting on the couch at the factory on the cover, and Lou, I think it's Harper Bazaar or something, he's whole magazine he's looking up. That wasn't one of the sets. It was just a casual shot I took of them on the couch. But that's the one that everyone liked, because everything else was too staged or formal or ridiculous, you know. This was just like a shot I got as I was walking by the couch. They were sitting there, and Lou looked at me, and, and it was like what they're really like. So that worked. So that was the third album cover. And on the back, I did this convoluted uh, double half Lou Reed uh, convolution. It's, it's like a, a, a deck of cards where the, joke, the jack has half of his head is this way and the other half is that way. You know, it's a convolution inversion of Lou with a really bong look on his face on the back of it, which I really loved that. So, uh, that one I actually got to do artwork on the back as well. The album represents a change in direction for the group's sound. With Kale gone, the aggressive avant-garde tone to the music changed and became softer and far more melodic. I like to think that the loudness and the, and, and the, the discordancy, or whatever you want to call it, that, that sort of typified those first two albums more um, maybe were the conflict that, between John and Lou, you know, that kind of brought to life in, in, in musical terms. But, but I, you know, that's just fantasy <laughs> on my part. Um, but I think that the third album was maybe because I was there and it was, um, um, I was more supportive of Lou than, uh, or, or more responsive to Lou than John was, I don't know. Uh, whether that's true or not, but may, allowed that to happen more, you know. But it's also, to a great extent, I think, what was the group was doing then. I mean, that's the way we, you know, we played Sister Ray live on stage, but uh, it was uh, a little bit sweeter. So there was always, I think, a desire 
on the part of Lou, and really, uh, you know, Sterling and Maureen as well, to just be able to make good records, and even to make a hit record. I know there was pressure on them, you know, from the label, from management, et cetera, et cetera, to do that, but, but I think innately in themselves is that they wanted to craft good rock and roll records that people would listen to. And if you look at some of the musical threads that go through them from their influences, I mean, they're very, uh, yeah, they took it into a very far away, but you still got the influences of, you know, Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, rockability, doo-wop, you know, that kind of real basic roots rock and roll, you still hear it in them. One day, I know we'll be back again, please wait till then. Aunt Lou was a doo-wop fiend. You know, Lou had a collection of doo-wop records that, you know, Mo has uh, commented on frequently. She said, I, you know, I would be like, ah, who are these bands? But people like the Spaniels. Uh, and that, you know, it's, it's, it's also key because the doo-wop bands of the 50s were very much street bands. Um, most of them were put together by groups of teenagers uh, who hung out, you know, on the corners, uh, had nothing to do, and they would start to throw vocal parts back and forth. In a sense, musically, he was t trying to do the same kind of thing, take what was really happening in the streets and apply it to their musical style. So the doo-wop stuff is, is of fairly key importance. You know, remember this is a guy who worked at Pickwick Records writing, you know, uh, replica hits, you know, replicas of the hits of the day. You know, this, this guy had that background, you know. He, you know, he's another Paul Simon in that sense. So I don't think, you know, uh, uh, you know don't shy away from the fact that he, that he wants to write pop songs. On the third album now, you've got this, this beautiful collection of soft, quiet songs. They're played quietly. Um, they're sung quietly. I think I think Lou Reed does a beautiful job of singing on those songs. I think to uh, to get Doug Yule in the band and to who was basically a kid and throw him into the mix and say, okay, this is what we're going to do now, um, was just was, worked out brilliantly. You, to, when you hear Doug singing, uh, Candy says, I don't believe Lou has ever sung Candy says as well, uh, whenever he has played it uh, later on. As Doug did. I sang Candy Says on that, and it was, um, I didn't know I was going to sing that song until we were doing the vocals. And he sang one, and he came back and said, Why don't you sing one? Candy says, I've come to hate my body and all that it requires in this. Charm of Candy says is that it is such a beautiful melody and such a beautiful song. The subject isn't that simple and it isn't uh, your run of the mill pop song subject. It's about Candy Darling, who was a transvestite and who was having issues with being a man. Jack obviously wanted to be a woman. When I sang Candy Says, um, uh, we'd only been playing the song for a little while and, and I didn't know what was, you know, really what was. Uh, what the song is about or, or, or the history involved in it. And uh, at, at some point when Lou was, when Lou and I were on the outs, he kind of made fun of me for that, uh, for not knowing what it was when I was singing it. And certainly had I known, I probably wouldn't have sung it um, because it wouldn't have uh, been relevant. But, uh, and I think part of the reason that it worked was because it, it, for me it meant something totally different. I think the fact that you do have other voices now on the record is, is kind of proof that Lou was much more relaxed with himself and was not fighting with the band. He wasn't fighting for control. He wasn't fighting to be heard because he knew that his songs would be heard. He didn't necessarily have to sing all of them. One, two, three. If you close the door, then 
the night could last forever leave the sun shine out and say hello to never all the people are dancing and they're having such fun i wish it could happen to me but if you close the door i'd never have to see the day again if you close the door the night could last forever leave the wine glass out and drink a toast to never oh someday i know someone will look into my eyes and say hello you're my very special one I really wanted to do it, but I, I'd never sung before, and I know I can't sing very well. And, but Lou wrote that for me to sing, and finally, I, I, I tried it like six times, and finally, I had to just tell everybody to leave. Sterling, had, Sterling was in the booth making fun of me, in the engineer's booth. The engineer was kind of scratching his head, like, why are we doing this? So finally, I said, everybody, everybody has to leave, just Lou and me, because... I can't do this, I'm really embarrassed, and I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it worked out well, everybody likes that song. The song itself, After Hours, uh, as Lou often always said when he introduced it in live, uh, in concert, he, it's about um, the, the clubs in New York that, um, that don't open until, you know, three in the morning, and they go till, you know, 10. 11, I don't know, whatever in the morning. And so f I don't think of it as a real dark song. I think of it as more of as just a kind of a, a, a whimsical kind of, well, if you, if you don't open the door, it's not daytime yet, you know? You know, not like a, a, a heavy philosophical, uh, you know, the night could last forever, uh, you know? So, so for me, it's not a, it, it, it doesn't have that, that aspect. I, I don't see that. The change in sound that characterizes the Grey album brought to the forefront Sterling Morrison's guitar playing and its contribution to the group's overall sound. Have you got a band with Lou Reed and John Cale fronting it? There's really no room for anybody else to make a statement. You know, anybody else is in the background. And, and really, um, you know, Moe and Sterling were a phenomenal rhythm section together, just absolutely phenomenal. We were basically the rhythm section, um, not the bass and me, but the guitar player and me. Sterling was a great rhythm guitar player, I think. Great rhythm guitar player. Um, yeah, mostly he was it, mostly rhythm. He had solos in, in a number of songs, and I think he's a, a ex. I loved his guitar playing. And if you listen, particularly to the third album, suddenly you start hearing much more of Sterling. Well, even until that point, Sterling played bass, he played rhythm. He was very much in the background. Sterling really started coming out. And I think, you know, in the early days of that new lineup, you know, Doug was obviously still feeling his way around. It's a pretty heavy-duty band to join. It's not like you're just your average, you know, blues band to get in there and, you know, play the riffs everybody knows. This is not your typical band. So I think he was feeling his way around, and I think it really gave Sterling the opportunity to step forward. One of the uh, great effects of the Velvet's 90, 1993 reunion tour was that finally people got to see who played what. Um, it may not have been great as far as, like, as far as being creative or as far as breaking new ground, but finally, uh, entire generation, uh, you know, there are people who grew up just hearing those records and uh, never ever had a chance to see the Velvets. I mean, most of us never had a chance to see the Velvets live. But now that we got to see them live, we got to see what an amazing guitar player Sterling Morrison was. On the existing uh, video of the tour, there's a, uh, his solo in rock and roll is just unbelievable. He could, he could probably have played that solo a million different ways and it would have been just as beautiful.
might have seemed to be coming more to the fore because this we were playing a lot less songs where you could just go off and do what you wanted to. They were at then they became much more structured. Yes, now the solo is twelve bars. You know? And Sterling thought that way. Sterling is very technically inclined person. Despite the epic scope of the Velvet Underground's first album, for many, the Grey album is in fact the best realised of all the band's recordings. That's the album in which he starts to really risk emotion, exp the, the expression of feeling, uh, for the first time, and he does it very, very effectively. What you get in, in the Velvet Underground is um, a cynic, a pessimist opening up. and. Uh, it's a it's a truly exciting record. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I like a lot of Lou, Lou Reed solo work. I don't think there'll ever be a record as good as that. I don't, I, you don't make more than one record like that in your life. The reason the Grey album is my favorite um, is because of the sound of it. Um, there was a, there was a, um, a sort of a, a zeitgeist. I don't know. It was a a, a a personality that the group had at that point. There was a um, a way that the group was together. We'd, we'd travel out every weekend and we'd come back. Uh, we'd play two or three nights, you know, and, and then once or twice a year we'd go on a longer, you know, two or three weeks out on the road. But, but it was very comfortable and warm and, you know, tight and, and it was really a band. And, and the reason I like that album is because it sounds like a band, you know, it, it, it reflects that. It looks, I mean, it, it, uh, it has that feeling to it, you know. This intense period of performing is reflected in the Velvet Underground Live 1969, which was compiled from several performances recorded that year. I think the live, the, the band live was a band. They were really, um, had the potential to be uh, very exciting. And um, uh, a lot of that was translated into recordings, but I don't think it ever the recordings ever equaled what the band could do live. Between recording the Grey album and Loaded, the band at some point during 1970 began to record what has become known as the famous Lost album. Although the recordings have appeared on various retrospective collections, there is still some confusion, even within the band itself, as to what the purpose of the recordings was intended to be. You're talking about the tapes uh, that Val Valentin engineered at MGM. I think those, yes, those are the ones, yeah. the ones with, those, with those set of songs on. Yeah, we, we spent, um, a, I think it was a summer, uh, some time in the summer going up to that studio and doing these um, recordings. And it was, as I understood it, now again, you know, I was not in many loops in those days. Uh, I, nobody told me very much, but my understanding was that we were uh, going to use the MGM studios to do, uh, to work out this stuff prior to actually going into a studio and recording it. We were, we were doing, we were taping stuff. Um, it was basically tracks and vocals and you know a few instrumentals in there um, to to sort of get organized for um, a, a recording, a regular recording session. Um, so I wasn't surprised when they weren't, you know, I, I, my understanding was that they were never going to be used. They were just for, they were work tapes. Um, and that's the way I always viewed them. The thing about the fourth album is if the intention was not to release that material, uh, that they, they were trying to get out of their contract with MGM or that they were uh, recording them as demos, the problem with that is why did Lou Reed go to such extraordinary lengths to make sure that those songs became public. You know, to the extent of making his first solo album effectively a remake <laughs> of the missing Velvet Underground album from 1969, by which point the songs are two years old. And Lou Reed, we know, because, you know, he recorded 27 new songs, which he demoed in 1971 before he ever made the first solo album. So he had an awful lot of songs that he could pull from. So, and yet he makes his first solo album, and it's almost a template for the missing Velvet Underground album. 
So clearly, for him to feel that strongly two years later about this material, it, it must be that he intended that material to come out. During the early part of 1970, Steve Sesnick negotiated the band's release from their contract with MGM, and the Velvet Underground quickly signed a new contract with Atlantic Records. During the early summer, the band agreed to play a residency at the New York club, Max's Kansas City. It would be the first time that the group had played in Manhattan since April 1967. However, it would not be the full lineup. Maureen Tucker had become pregnant and was not performing with the group. In her stead, Doug Yule's brother, Billy, had been drafted in as a replacement. The Max's gig, to me, was kind of weird. First of all, no mo. Right away, that's weird, you know, because, you know, not to slight Billy Yule as a young kid, but he was playing a conventional, you know, kind of rock and roll drums, you know, a lot of cymbal work, you know. It, it just wasn't the thing. The other thing about Max is it was such a scene that in part the Velvets were just kind of the backdrop to people hanging out and doing what they're doing and making a scene and, you know, being cool, et cetera, et cetera. Max's Kansas City was the Andy Warhol crowd's watering hole. It was their club of choice is where they would end, the, end their nights um, long into the mornings and uh, where they would go to have fun. So it was a perfect place for the band to now play. They effect effectively became the house band uh, at Max's Kansas City. They played there. They had started a, a two-week engagement and extended it to eight weeks, I believe, because it was so popular. Uh, but they were packing it with their friends. It's not like they were drawing people from um, the outlying suburbs or from other states or whatever. It was really just a place to play and have fun with your friends now that you're back in town. It was, it was very small, it was very intimate, it was fun. You know, it was, it was like playing at a house concert just about, because half the people there, everybody knew, you know. Successful musically, you know, um, and there was an opportunity because it was five nights a week and two sets a night maybe, maybe three, to, um, to experiment with some stuff, um, to uh, try out new, new material, you know, or different ways of doing new material. Sometimes um, Lou would say, oh, why don't you sing that one tonight, you know, and I, so I would, you know, and, and of course I don't know, I never knew all the words because I'm not a words person, but, but you know, we'd do it just for fun. <laughs> While playing at Max's, the band began recording sessions for what would become their fourth album, Loaded. One of, one of the things I remember is, is when we were starting the sessions, is uh, Steve Sesnick and Lou um, wheeling one of the Sun amps through the streets of Manhattan because they couldn't get it in a taxi and they did, Sesnick didn't want to pay for a truck. So they literally, it was on wheels, it was a big cabinet, it was as tall as you are, you know. And they wheeled it through the streets um, from 50 West, from East 57th or East 55th over to uh, Central Park West, where the studio, the big studio for Atlantic was, and broke a wheel and doing it, da -da -da -da. but they had to have that for the session. We just, we were in the big studio, we started um, tracking. The process was very uh, introspective and very uh, dissective. It was, you know, pick it apart and put it back together and, and, and um, build this kind of uh, puzzle of a song, um, which, as I was saying before, is very different than the third album, which was more very organic, and you know, uh, this was more like grafting fruit trees. You know, you graft one thing onto another and and uh, see what you get. Oh, where Loaded was being recorded, there is this feeling that the band was breaking up. Um, it did well. You did have Maureen Tucker missing which was, uh, she was an essential, absolutely invaluable part of that band. And with her gone, you, again, you're, you're looking at trying to replace someone who was really irreplaceable. I didn't play on that album, and it was a, a big disappointment. There was a few songs that needed me. <laughs> For instance, Ocean, Here Come the Waves, that I was really disappointed that if I couldn't play on that one, that I didn't get to end happily. This makes me feel very happy, um, not in a, a boastful way or a, a, or a told you so way, but um, Lou and, uh, excuse me, Doug have both said since they should have waited for Mo. And Billy Yule, fine, fine drummer, but in, too, too normal.
If there's any one thing I could do over again would be to refuse to do Loaded until Maureen was well again. Uh, not well, until she was, you know, able to play. Because by her not being there, um, it wasn't a band anymore. And, and, I, and, I, and the thing I, like I said before, that I love about the third album is that it's a band. And the thing I hate about Loaded is it's not a band. Despite many people's misgivings about the album, it does contain several truly remarkable songs. Amongst these is probably the most recognizable and influential of their entire canon of work. There's this idea that Loaded may not be as great a Velvet Underground album as the previous three, uh, or certainly as the first one, but it did come, it did yield uh, Sweet Jane, which is a beautiful anthemic almost uh, rock song. And I believe that uh, for all of the people who claim to have been influenced by the Velvet Underground, I think that if you look at their music, they were probably more influenced by the material on Loaded than they were the material on the first album. Standing on the corner Suitcase in my hand Jackson's corset, Jane is in her vest And me, I'm in a rock and roll band huh. Riding the studs back at Jim You know, those were different times all, all the poets, they studied rules of verse And those ladies, they rolled their eyes Rock and Roll and Sweet Jane are uh, probably the greatest songs the Velvet Underground ever recorded. Uh, I mean, certainly the most influential songs that the Velvet Underground ever recorded, the, the ones that other people want to sing, the ones that people remember. That guitar figure was, was finalized just around the time we started recording it. You know, it had been a little different, a l not as strong before that. Um, and after that, that, that really defines the song. Um, uh, playing it live after that was all about that, that particular guitar figure. and, and uh, you know, I mean, to this day, it, if you play that, and anybody who's ever heard it will say, oh, that's Sweet Jane, you know? Lou wrote a bridge for Sweet Jane, and um, when the first version came out, it was edited out um, to, you know, fit on the record, to make it more in line with the short sort of pop song. And uh, Lou you know, pitched the bitch that he said frequently the song was ruined by the fact that this bridge was taken out. Sterling saying to me that, you know, that they wanted to, to prove to everyone that you know, they could actually write classic rock songs that, uh, that should get played on the radio. In fact, they didn't get played on the radio. But it's hard to believe when you listen to Sweet Jane and Rock and Roll and, and Who Loves the Sun. The run up to Loaded was, um, was kind of fraught with or was was uh, the, the the feeling that was going on was that we needed more airplay and this was again was Steve Sesnick was um, he saw that in order to we need to generate more commercial success in order to maintain uh, the group and you know it's like a bit a small business you know you've got to grow or you die it, it was a kind of a constant thing about airplay getting being more commercial being uh, more accepted in the the um, the FM world, and uh, a lot of those songs were engineered, were, were 
were recorded and engineered and edited and the whole focus was to get airplay. They're cut down to, you know, from maybe five or six minutes down to like two minutes 40 or something just to get that, you know, into that rotation, the, the, the FM or even the AM rotation. Um, the, the topics are more poppy. Um, I mean, if you listen to Who Loves the Sun, that's unloaded, right? I mean, that's a, that's a straight pop song. Straight, flat-out pops. The songs that end up being chosen for Loaded are too far down the line. They're too, they're too much of a commercial compromise. Um, and, and therefore, it's very tempting to see it as Reed being pushed into a position where he actually... The ambivalence has to go. And, and, and with that, he can't... The, the compromises are too great. Reed has to leave the band because essentially that isn't what he wants. One night during the group's residency at Max's Kansas City, Lou Reed abruptly and unexpectedly quit the band. And Lou called me outside and we said, there were stairs that went on the outside of the building, kind of, sort of, that went up there. And we sat on the steps and he told me he was leaving. Um, I didn't say why because I felt he would have told me why if he wanted to. So I, I don't really know exactly why he wanted to leave. Um, but yeah, that was, that was quite a shock, quite a shock. It was a total shock. He, I mean, it was a total surprise. He was just one, you know, one week he was there, we came back and literally until the show was about to start, um, I was expecting him to turn up. I thought he was late. Lou Reed's abrupt departure from the band signaled the end of the classic period of the Velvet Underground. Although the group continued playing together and even recorded a further Doug Yule penned album, it was never again to reach the inventive success of the original lineup. Even though the band was never recognised within their own time, their influence and importance is now universally acknowledged. The quote that I open from the Velvets to the Voidoids with, it's a Lester Bangs quote, he, he says, modern music begins with the Velvets. It's a hugely important quote, not least because he's absolutely right. In other words, Whatever came before the Velvet Underground is something else. Uh, I'm not sure I'd call it rock music. Essentially, it required Bob Dylan to make Highway 61 and the Velvet Underground to make Velvet Underground and Nico for there to be such a thing as rock music. Um, there was pop, there was rock and roll, there was all sorts of things before that. But actually, no, uh, modern music began with the Velvet Underground. I can't explain why it was so influential. I, I, it's totally a mystery to me. I, it just confused. It eludes me because it was just a band. It was just a lot of fun, and we had, you know, it was it was amazing that it was going on at the time because we we were all saying like, wow, people are paying us money to do the thing we'd be wanting to do anyway. To be honest, I would rather it be the way it is than us to have made ten million dollars, and it didn't matter. 10 million would be real nice, but honestly, I really, it's great, it's great to go play somewhere and have a 18-year-old say, oh, I love your music, and you changed my life, and things like that. It's, it's just really, wow, you know? <laughs>